Hello, welcome to part two of our lecture on chapter four. At the end of part one, we recognize there are two forms of stratified squamous epithelium, a non-keratinized form and a keratinized form. And we're gonna pick up here with the keratinized form, which is part of our skin or what we might call our integumentary system. So it's good to recognize that the skin is our largest organ. Obviously it covers our entire body. Interestingly enough, the liver is our biggest internal organ, which is actually pretty darn big for something tucked in us, but it's not gonna be as big and heavy as this big wrapper on the outside of us. So the skin only has two layers. We wanna talk about those two layers, but we also wanna talk about a related layer that's gonna to bind the skin to underlying structures. So we'll begin with the most superficial or outer layer, what we call the epidermis. And we can see that over to the right, and the first thing you'll notice is it looks like at least two layers, maybe three or four, and it actually can be more than that. So it's multiple cells thick, and the cells differentiate into different looking layers. Most noticeably, the very outside of this looks different than the underlying cells. That is, we can't see nuclei, the cells are flatter, and they are dry and will actually flake off, um, contributing to some of our household dust. So this outer layer, the epidermis, is composed of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. It's many layers with an outer layer that is dead and dry and protective. And then underneath that, we have layers that give rise to new cells or that produce melanin, a pigment that helps to protect some of those deeper down cells. So within this, we wanna talk about two types of cells in particular, and those are going to be this Langerhans cell and this Langerhans cell is an example of what we call a macrophage. These are white blood cells, some of which roam the body, some of which are residents in tissues like this cell. And basically this is going to help prevent things from getting through our skin to infect us. Because obviously in our epidermis here, there are no blood vessels. But if you get through that into the underlying dermis, you're going to be able to invade blood vessels and we're going to have kind of a bigger problem. The other cell is going to be a melanocyte, and that's this brown one down here. So this melanocyte produces our skin pigment, melanin. Melanin does come in a couple of different forms, which help account for the different colors of people. So once we take those two forms into account and the amount of melanin produced, we can kind of encompass a broad range of skin colors. And we see that down below here. First, you'll notice some of the outer layers that are actually kind of peeling away from the rest of the skin. But down near the bottom of the skin, before we get to that pink layer underneath, there's kind of a brown substance associated with these cells here. That's the melanin that the melanocytes have been producing. And one of the jobs of that is to protect cells like this one here we see in cell division, which gives rise to the new cells that migrate towards the top surface. Well, this cell down here can be protected by that pigment, and therefore we're less likely to suffer damage to our skin Obviously, this can, of course, result in skin cancers. All right, so the question is, if UV radiation is damaging, why can some UV radiation be beneficial? In other words, why would we have problems if we don't have access to any UV radiation? And the example here is that, well, UV radiation helps to convert a steroid, a cholesterol-like molecule that's in our skin into vitamin D. And vitamin D, when activated, causes the absorption of calcium by the kidney and the intestines. And we'll see a little bit of that going on over here. We're going to talk later about homeostasis, maintaining a constant internal environment. And we have glands like the parathyroids located on the back of our thyroid gland, which produce a hormone. And this hormone's job, in part, is to activate vitamin D, which is going to lead essentially to this reabsorption of calcium from kidney tubules so that we're not urinating out calcium that we need and to increase our ability to absorb calcium from our digestive tract. All right, so the deep layer of the skin, the one that's underneath the epidermis, is simply called the dermis. It's composed of dense irregular connective tissue and we, or we talked earlier about dense fibrous connective tissue. So we recognized it came in different varieties. Since this is dense irregular, it means the collagen fibers go in all kinds of different directions, meaning that the dermis is tough, 
but it's not as tough in one particular direction as something like a tendon or ligament might be. And so we see the dermis extending from the epidermis down to a region where we start to have some adipose cells. And that's obviously going to be our deeper underlying region that binds the skin to other components. So this idea of the dermis relates though to a number of different things, things like stretch marks, but also to wrinkles. And so when we think about wrinkles, which often come with old age and sun exposure, but can be made worse by smoking, these result from a loss of collagen and elastic fibers. So our skin is no longer held together as tightly as it once was. And so this idea of sun exposure causing wrinkles is probably pretty important to a lot of us because we may get a lot of sun exposure during the year. And if we want to stay young looking, we want to protect ourselves from that UV radiation and do things like avoid tanning booths. Of course, smoking is also good to avoid. Smoking may decrease blood flow, particularly to the edges of your body, and decreased blood flow may contribute to these wrinkles as well as a lot of health problems. All right, so deep to our dermis, we have something called the subcutaneous layer. So the subcutaneous means under the skin. Cutaneous membrane is another word we can use to describe the skin. And of course, we probably already know a little bit about the subcutaneous layer because this layer that has areolar and adipose tissue within it is a common site for injections. What's kind of cool about this diagram up here is they show a number of different ways in which injections might be given. Obviously, to be intramuscular, to actually put the injection inside of muscle, you have to get pretty deep down. But a subcutaneous injection is going to deposit whatever the medication is into the subcutaneous tissue where it can be distributed and then picked up by blood cells. You can see here they're using a 45 degree angle to do this. It's no surprise we might call a needle like this a hypodermic needle because hypodermis is a synonym for subcutaneous layer. Okay, we also need to talk about some of the accessory organs of the skin. And when we think about those, those are derived from the epidermis. And this can be a little bit weird to think about. Accessory organs are hair, glands, and nails. And if we think about hair and we look at this hair coming out, yeah, it comes out from the epidermis, but it sure does look like it's growing from within the dermis. What we're missing is that cells from the epidermis invaginate deep into the dermis and those are what form the hair follicle. So we are deriving hair from epidermal tissue. And the same thing can be true for glands. We can see a duct here that's going to empty out onto our epidermis. And if we follow that down, the gland is going to consist of tissue that is epidermal in nature. And there's kind of a way in which we know that this is likely to occur. The one thing about this is that our dermis is composed of this dense irregular connective tissue but glands are going to need to secrete, and that's a property not of connective tissue, but of epithelial tissue. And of course, our epidermis is composed of epithelial tissue. So what kind of glands do we have? We're not gonna talk about all of them. We'll talk about two major types, sebaceous and sudoriferous. Sebaceous glands, like the one we see here associated with this hair follicle, are gonna release oils. So those oils will be released onto our skin or into our hair follicles. And of course, we recognize that if these glands become inflamed, we get acne. And that means that we're basically going to plug these things up. They're going to get filled up with oil. And, you know, we can get whiteheads and blackheads as a result of that. Sudoriferous glands are going to be our sweat glands. And we can see those in a number of different spots. Now, these are generally going to rise up towards the skin surface. And they're going to put more of a watery fluid onto our skin. And this is going to help us with thermoregulation. And we talked about this maybe earlier in the semester. We know that it takes a lot of energy to convert liquid water into a gas, and therefore we can use that to remove heat from our body. We will sometimes put sweat directly onto hairs, particularly in areas like our armpit. And we do actually have two different kinds of sweat glands, some of which we have all of our life, and some of which we start to develop at puberty, which tend to provide a little bit more odor with that sweat. Okay, so this chapter also mentions organ systems, and we're not going to really spend time on them, but it's probably very important that you take a look at this table in your book. It's going to give you an idea of the kind of things that we're going to get into throughout the semester, 
Of course, the integumentary system we just breezed through here in this chapter, and we recognize it does a lot of important things. It protects our body. It's an outer wrapper. It provides temperature homeostasis, so the fat within our subcutaneous layer can help keep us warm, and the sweating can cool us down when we need to. We're going to synthesize vitamin D here, which is essential for our calcium metabolism. And of course, we receive some sensory input from the outside through our skin as well. But you can get an idea of everything we're going to get into by reading brief descriptions of them here. Next, we're going to get into the cardiovascular system. And it's kind of a cool system because it has to connect all of our other systems together. And so, of course, it's going to have many, many roles and will be um, very interesting. So take a look at these. They're not going to be tested on at this point, but we will cover every single system here. One question you might want to ask yourself is why do we have two people for the last two systems? And that, of course, for the re reproductive system makes a great deal of sense because we have males and females with different reproductive organs. But we might also think about that in the endocrine system as well, where the female is going to have ovaries and the male is going to have testes. So in these cases, we're going to have some very large differences in the systems. Whereas in other systems, things will be fundamentally the same, but there may be some small differences to take a look at. All right, we're going to take a look at body cavities, though, and we have two of them. Now, one of the great things about learning anatomy is we find out that when somebody says we have two of something, it probably means there's a lot more going on than that. And of course, we can divide our cavities up into smaller pieces. So we'll begin with our dorsal cavity as opposed to, say, our ventral cavity. And these are good words to know. Dorsal means towards the back, and a synonym for that is posterior. We can see here that that consists of the cranial cavity, and that's going to, of course, be holding our brain. And then we have this vertebral cavity, or we often call this the vertebral canal, and this is going to contain our spinal cord. So those two together equal the dorsal or posterior cavity. And now this big cavity towards the front is our ventral cavity. Ventral is essentially a synonym for anterior, which means towards the front. When we think about the ventral cavity, we can divide this up, and the dividing line is the diaphragm, this muscular partition that separates the upper thoracic cavity from the lower abdominal pelvic cavity. Now what you'll notice about this image is it mentions here we have an abdominal cavity and a pelvic cavity. And we do, although there's not a great definition of the boundary between those, there is no diaphragm here which is really separating those, uh, but we do draw a distinction between abdominal and pelvic organs based on their location. However, we recognize this is fundamentally one cavity and we also recognize that we can combine words like abdominal and pelvic together. So since abdominal is the first word, we take the AL off of the end of it, we replace that with an O, and we squish that together with pelvic to talk about the abdominopelvic cavity. Therefore, it's more accurate to say that the ventral cavity consists of two cavities, the thoracic and abdominopelvic cavities, divided by the diaphragm. And then we can make the distinction between abdominal and pelvic if we wish to do so. All right, so we're going to take a look at membranes, which we find sometimes in these cavities. And of course, we have membranes in other places as well. So when we're thinking about our membranes, we can start with mucous membranes. And having talked about tissues, we know that columnar epithelia creates mucus through what we call goblet cells. So these are going to be our mucous membranes. We find them in our digestive tract our respiratory tract, and in tubes of our reproductive tract. And of course, mucus provides some benefits to us. It's going to provide protection from invasive particles like bacteria and viruses. And in our digestive tract, will actually keep us from digesting ourselves, so protecting us from things like stomach acid. Now, this cool picture in the bottom right gives us an idea of what's going on with mucus within our respiratory tract. We see columnar cells. And we also see some shorter cells, so that reminds us that this is probably pseudostratified. And we see cilia atop the cells. So we know that this is our ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. And we see particles in here, which we've breathed in, which have been trapped in mucus. And the cilia is going to wave those up. And what it's going to do is wave those up through our respiratory tubes until we get out of our respiratory tubes and into our throat at which point we can actually either spit out or swallow these particles and the mucus associated with them so that we're protecting our respiratory system.
Now we also have serous membranes, and these relate very directly to that ventral cavity. These lines support and connect things that are in our body cavities. So they're going to be lining the body cavities, connecting organs to the body cavities, and acting as pathways for blood vessels. They are specifically associated with our heart, lungs, and abdominal organs, and they secrete a watery lubricating fluid to make sure that we can have movement in these areas without damaging these thin membranes or the organs that they are associated with. And so what you'll see here is that we have three words, pleury, pericardium, and peritoneum. Usually I might use the singular term pleura, and these are going to be names for the membranes that are associated with these. In each case, we actually have two. We use the word visceral, which means organ, for the membrane that's on the organ surface and parietal for sacs or membranes that are associated with the wall. For instance, your heart sits within the parietal pericardium. That's going to be the sac which contains your heart. And the very outer layer of your heart is called the visceral pericardium. Okay, we have two other membrane types. Synovial membranes are inside of our joints. This picture here doesn't really show that, but it explains where that would be. So they've cut off the joint capsule and they show a joint cavity for a synovial joint. That means that there's a space between the bones where they articulate. Now there's a meniscus in here that would be composed of fibrocartilage because this is our knee and there's going to be hyaline cartilage where it labels this as articular cartilage and that's a nice smooth cartilage. But synovial fluid produced by the synovial membranes is going to help to lubricate that joint and kind of prevent damage that occurs. Now, we can, in some instances, get arthritis, that would be rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, things like that, where we're going to get inflammation of these synovial membranes, we're going to have restricted joint movement, and then damage to these cartilage surfaces and eventually to these joints. Meninges are actually very different than all the rest of these. These are connective tissue membranes, and we see some here. We have what we call the arachnoid mater and the dura mater, in this case, wrapped around the spinal cord. We'd also find these not just around the spinal cord, but also around the brain itself. But these are connective tissue membranes, so they don't secrete. They will instead contain cerebrospinal fluid, and we'll learn later about the secretion of that. Associated with the meninges, this collection of membranes, there's actually a third one as well called the pia mater, which we can't see because it basically looks like the outer surface of the spinal cord. But there's a condition associated with these, and that is meningitis. And the ending of this, itis, means inflammation. So meningitis would be inflammation of meninges, just in the same way that the arthritis we talked about earlier is inflammation of joints, because arthro refers to joints. So meningitis can be either bacterial or viral, and there are vaccines to protect us against some forms of this. Now, college students, particularly freshmen living in dorms, places where people are cohabitating closely together, are commonly um, at risk for this. So that's an important thing to recognize, is that the risk of meningitis varies at your um, particular stage of life, and some of it has to do with your association with other people. All right, so our final topic for this chapter is going to be homeostasis, the capacity to maintain a constant internal environment and to use your body's physiological processes to adjust to maintain some kind of stable point. For instance, we maintain a constant body temperature, a constant blood glucose level, and do the same thing for many other factors such as calcium levels. And we can do this through something called a negative feedback mechanism. And so if we take a look at negative feedback, we have some kind of control center that can respond to stimuli and we have to think about what it's going to be doing. We can see that down here on the bottom. So we want to maintain homeostasis, a nice constant environment, and obviously we can dip too low or too high. So in this case, if we get too high, there's too much of whatever's going on, too much blood sugar, we get too hot, that's the stimulus which some sensor is going to pick up. We're gonna send information to our control center, which is going to direct a response and we're going to produce some kind of effect that returns us back to our normal value. So we have to kind of get an, maybe an idea of how this is going to work in a particular case. And we can see that here. We're going to talk about body temperature. And I've divided this into two pictures so that they're nice and big. But we'll start here with us at a normal body temperature. And then we drift to above normal. So that's our stimulus.
and we're going to get information here in our brain and we're going to recognize that you know we're not at the right value we are too warm we need to cool back down to 98.6 and so we're going to direct a response to this we're going to secrete sweat and we're going to dilate blood vessels meaning we're going to bring more blood to our skin so we're bringing this blood from our warm body out to our outside which we are making wet we're going to have that sweat evaporate taking heat away and of course that heat is going to come away from that blood so we can deliver that cooler blood back to the core of our body and return our body temperature to normal okay there's other options though what if we fall below our normal body temperature well that's a stimulus too and again we're going to have sensors in a control center the same ones which are going to be able to direct a different kind of response so in this case we constrict our blood vessels meaning we put less blood to the outside of our body where we are potentially losing heat because we're in a cold environment now this could be being in a cold body of water this could just be you know being outside not wearing enough clothing and so we're going to make sure our sweat glands are inactive we don't want to be sweaty when we're cold because that's going to make us lose more heat we might even shiver which is going to cause us to actually generate some body heat and that all should help us return back up to a normal body temperature okay but what if we don't want to maintain a constant set point what if instead we need to start a process and finish that process and I can't think of a better example than giving birth once you start giving birth you really just need to get that done and then once you're done you don't need to do whatever it is that you had to do to get that process done anymore so you want it to stop well we're describing here a positive feedback mechanism and so this is a mechanism where we get an increasing change but it's in a single direction this is not the raising and if it gets too high lowering to create a balancing act but rather starting something and having the very starting of that process cause us to more intensely engage in that process ending only when the stimulus ends so the example I'm going to cover here is birth we have a child in here and we're going to have some muscular contractions of the uterus and that's going to stretch this cervix down below here and as the child's head pushes into the cervix and stretches that that's going to actually create positive feedback so we have to think about what's going on in here what the mechanism is well there's a hormone that's produced by your hypothalamus and stored in your posterior pituitary gland called oxytocin and one of the things that it does is it creates uterine contractions the uterus of course lined by smooth muscle meaning that these are going to be involuntary so oxytocin as that increases will cause uterine contractions the baby's head pushing into the cervix is going to cause more oxytocin to be produced which is going to increase the intensity of uterine contractions eventually though uterine contractions along with assistance from abdominal muscles may cause us to give birth and to have the baby come out through the vaginal canal and be born at which point it's no longer going to be stretching the cervix which means we're not going to continue that oxytocin production and while we still may have uterine contractions for a while they should begin to kind of decrease in intensity and of course there actually is some value for having those uterine contractions it may help to tighten back up the uterus also we're going to get oxytocin produ production through breastfeeding because it's also related to milk letdown so we still may get some things for pregnant women after this but not with it the same intensity that we had during the actual birthing process